the Boeing B-29 Superfortress. Iconic by any standards, among its many achievements were its nuclear capability, which ended the war in the Pacific and helped ensure the United States Army Air Force would become a completely separate and independent part of the U.S. military. However, despite the inter-service rivalry with the Army Air Force, some credit for the success of the atomic attacks on Japan should go to the U.S. Navy. Certainly it was General Groves who ran the Manhattan Project. However, Oppenheimer appointed a Navy captain, William Parsons, to head the critical ordnance aspect of the project. And Parsons later chose Frederick Ashcroft, a Navy commander, to join the operation as the most skilled person available. These two men were also considered the most qualified to fly as weaponeers for the atomic bombs used to attack Japan. Such inter-service cooperation was not always the case. Over the years, there had been a heavy rivalry between the U.S. Navy and the Army Air Service, and later the Army Air Corps, over which service had the responsibility for defending the American homeland. Many of these disputes were initiated as the Army gained access to bomber aircraft with greater range, and thereby competed with the Navy's maritime monopoly of protecting the nation from approaching enemy warships. On the other hand, the Navy insisted it had a right to land-based multi-engine patrol bombers, something the Army Air Corps totally opposed. After the First World War, Air power in its various forms had proven its importance. Something that was hardly a consideration when the Great War started, it had proved mighty by the time the conflict was over. In June and July of 1921, Army General William Mitchell wanted to underscore that point by sinking unmanned German battleships with shore-based Army bombers. This signaled the start of intensive inter-service rivalry that would go on for years. Every sort of pretext, and all kinds of people, would try to stop the tests. Pressure was even applied to Congress and President Harding, with a view to stopping the exercise. Such was the level of indignation within the Navy. Secretary of the Navy Daniels stated that he would stand bareheaded on the bridge of any battleship during any bombardment by any plane by God, and expect to remain safe. The bombing experiments went ahead and largely proved Mitchell's point. However, so great was the controversy, and so concerned were both the Army and the Navy about the adverse public opinion, that Mitchell's career was irreparably damaged. He died in 1936, aged just 57, although his views on air power and of the need for a totally independent air force persisted, and to this day he is known as the father of the U.S. Air Force. In July of 1926, the Army Air Service officially became the Army Air Corps. This action did nothing to reduce the Navy fears of possible Army encroachments. Although at the same time, there were also those in the Army who were concerned that an expanded air arm might also look to fulfill Mitchell's prediction of dividing the service. Meanwhile, the Navy wasn't sitting still and looked to increase the number and capability of their flying boats. This is the consolidated Model 28, known as the PBY by the Navy and Catalina by the British. It actually went into service with the U.S. Navy in 1936, with only two engines. It was, of course, somewhat slower and less well-armed than many Army bombers, but it had an incredible range and was relatively inexpensive to build. It was very reliable and gave the Navy an effective large aircraft. Large and versatile, it was able to carry bombs and depth charges, perform reconnaissance duties, and even air-sea rescue missions. Also, many PBYs were amphibians, and able to use land bases. Although very much against the Navy's wishes, over time the Army Air Corps sought to extend some of its responsibilities, including being able to fly certain coastal defense missions. This might open the way for the service to acquire four-engine bombers. Aircraft of the type could also be able to fly strategic bombing missions, 
something that the purists in the army feared the Air Corps would use as justification for autonomy. In 1936, the Air Corps contracted with Boeing for just 13 four-engine B-17 bombers and many more smaller two-engine Douglas types. Even the existence of such small numbers of B-17s seriously aggravated both the Navy and the Luddite factions in the Army. In March of 1938, a substantial order for 144 B-17s was finally made, but not for long. Two months later, the Air Corps succeeded in demonstrating its improved powers of naval interception and employed early B-17s in finding the Italian liner Rex hundreds of miles out to sea. The Navy's response was predictable and extremely bellicose. The new B-17s were cancelled, and General Frank Andrews, who authorized the exercise, was rewarded with an unwelcome tour in San Antonio, Texas. However, the B-17's lead navigator was quickly recognized for his talents. His name was Curtis Lee May. As a direct result of the B-17 cancellations, when the Second World War started, the Air Corps had only 14 Flying Fortress aircraft in service. Such was the price of trying to contain the Air Corps. In mid-1941, the Air Corps evolved into the U.S. Army Air Force, which obtained more autonomy from both the Army and the Navy. However, which service flew what missions was still an issue, as larger, very long-range flying boats were planned to give the Navy a greater patrol bomber capability, similar to some Army bombers. The Navy's early success with the CAT, as it was often referred to, ensured that other more advanced long-range flying boats were developed. One was Consolidated's Model 31. The prototype XP-4Y Corregidor appeared in May 1939. It had the advantage of all that had been learned from the Catalina. However, it also had the best and most efficient laminar flow wings that Consolidated could acquire, designed by David Davis. This, together with the use of new Wright 3350 Cyclone engines and an advanced hull, increased the performance of the XP-4Y to the extent that a completely new factory was built in New Orleans, specifically to make 200 of the type. So successful was the Davis laminar flow wing that when the Air Corps needed a backup for the B-17, the Davis wing was employed in making the next consolidated project, the Model 32, later known as the B-24 Liberator. Over 18,000 Liberators were produced in just four years. This is the Mark I Liberator, as it was named by the British. In mid-1941, early models were quickly ferried to England, where they served with Bomber Command. However, the RAF found that their lack of defensive armor and self-sealing fuel tanks made them unsuitable for air raids over Europe. On the other hand, the aircraft's very long range and heavy payload suited RAF Coastal Command's anti-U-boat work perfectly. Back in the United States, the impressive Davis laminar flow wing was still slated for new corrigidors. So how many of the 200 advanced flying boats went into service? The answer is none. The single very promising XP-4Y prototype was the sole example, and the new factory went on to make more of the older Catalinas. There were several likely reasons for this. One would have been the great need for proven long-range flying boats in the Battle of the Atlantic, the longest battle of the entire war. And one where two consolidated designs, the PBY and the B-24, played a major role in destroying German and Italian U-boats. Either way, from the Navy's point of view, it must have looked like they would have been stuck with the PBYs and another pre-war flying boat, the PBM Mariner, for the duration of the war. However, there still seemed to be some hope. In Seattle, the Boeing Company was still involved in the Navy's quest for a more modern long-range flying boat. Boeing's qualifications for the task were good. The company had previously designed their Model 314 Clipper, civilian flying boat, a giant of an aircraft, especially for that time. The Clipper presented a major technological challenge, which Boeing was able to meet. 
Boeing's next flying boat was to be a total military exercise. The prototype was given the prefix XPBB and the name Sea Ranger. The first prototype flew in July of 1942, and with an order for 57 production versions on hand, a brand new plant was especially built at Renton on the shores of Lake Washington. The XPBB had many advanced features, although the most impressive was its range. The Sea Ranger was expected to deliver a service range of well over 6,000 miles. However, these results could only be achieved with the aid of a fuel-saving catapult launch from massive barges and employing just two of the powerful R-3350 engines, the same power plants as used in the cancelled Corregidor. Also accommodated with the consolidated flying boat was that the Sea Ranger, despite all its promise, never went into production. So what happened this time? The Sea Ranger's stablemate, the B-29 Super Fortress, was the main problem. The first orders for the B-29 were placed with Boeing in May of 1941. Early lessons from the war were coming to hand, which established the importance of an especially high-performance aerial bomber, as well as certain issues known to very few people about something called the atomic bomb. The production of such an advanced high-flying land bomber was now a primary objective in winning the war. Years earlier, the Air Corps fought hard for the most advanced B-17, and they were ultimately proven right. And now, in September of 1942, the first B-29 had arrived. However, if large numbers of the most sophisticated aircraft ever were to be built en masse, then it would need priority over all else, even if that meant cancelling two advanced Navy flying boats, in part because they would have used the same power plants now needed for the B-29. Even so, on a matter like this, the Navy needed to be placated, and a deal had to be struck. Clearly, this would be the tipping point in going forward, for both the Army and the Navy, so certain accommodations would have to be made in both directions. Firstly, the Renton plant built especially for the Sea Ranger, being so close to Boeing's other Seattle facilities, would be needed for the early B-29 deliveries although three other even larger plants would also be built in Omaha, Nebraska, Wichita, Kansas, and Marietta, Georgia. The Sea Ranger, the ultimate flying boat which the Navy had waited so long for, was dead, along with the Corregidor. However, the Navy had its price. Army resistance to the Navy's land-based patrol bombers was to go, and there would be modifications to the Navy's B-24s to handle the U.S. anti-submarine work. This was a task that the Air Corps didn't really mind losing anyway. The Navy was also to share the Marines' Lockheed PV-1 patrol aircraft and B-25 attack aircraft. Later, as a show of greater independence, the Navy had its own purpose-built maritime version of the B-24 developed, known as the PB-4Y-2, or Privateer, an aircraft that even came equipped with early missilery for anti-shipping warfare. Although the Navy had to be satisfied with its pre-war design Catalinas and Mariner flying boats, they both served well, and with many new Allied air bases available, especially in the Pacific, their need had become less critical. The Army Air Force had its eyes set on going forward with the most advanced aircraft in the world and going on to the post-war period. However, the war had to be won first, and the B-29 held the key to that. On the 9th of August 1945, the second atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, followed by the Japanese surrender on the 2nd of September. Two years and 16 days later, under the 1947 National Security Act, the United States Air Force finally came into being. Air Force General Henry Harley Arnold writes in 1941, A nation likely and able to win a war will enter it not only with the largest and most efficient Air Force, but behind that first line will stand the second line, the ability to maintain that superior strength in men and machines. Three years later, the General's prophecy is now reality. On June 15, 1944, the first B-29s fly over mainland Japan. 
unlike the Doolittle raid two years prior. This is a mission of epic proportions. That is because Boeing's Super Fortress, the largest plane in the world, is designed for destruction. With wings spreading over 140 feet, a fuselage 98 feet long, and four engines each possessing 2,200 horsepower, the Super Fortress is the envy of the entire world, a true symbol of American industrial power. Billions of dollars, combined with the blood, sweat, and tears of its creators, make this the most feared aircraft of the Second World War. For it is a weapon that doesn't start wars, it finishes them. For all its accolades and accomplishments, the Super Fortress is America's biggest gamble of the war. A design so complicated, it is the most expensive risk for the United States government. A project that at times seems doomed for failure, and a project that requires a contingency plan. What to do if it never makes it out of the factories? Where to go if the people of Boeing cannot get the job done? This is the secret history behind one of aviation's greatest bombers and how it almost never came to be. The what-if scenarios that America is prepared to take in order to get it off the ground and win the war raging in the Pacific. This is the race for the Super Fortress. Even before America is officially involved in the Second World War, the B-29 is already envisioned. The need for long-range aircraft capable of rendering a decisive blow against any potential enemy is an urgent priority for visionary generals like Hap Arnold. For the next two and a half years, as America remains officially neutral, they are behind the scenes, making extensive plans that include a barrage of new military projects. With a long-range bomber, high on the list. Not until the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in December of 1941 do the wheels begin to seriously move. In the first few weeks of war, over 350 of the 525 combat planes we had in the Pacific area were destroyed. Over one quarter of our total combat strength was lost. We suddenly found ourselves engaged in a mortal struggle with an enemy who could be counted on for nothing except bitter and fanatic opposition. According to President Roosevelt, uh, the United States was not particularly well prepared um, to engage in the war itself. In 1940, Roosevelt um, called for increased congressional appropriations for military spending, arguing that what the United States needed was to be producing 50,000 planes per year. In 1939, the U.S. produced fewer than 6,000 planes. With the United States at war against both Japan and Germany, bombers are rushed into service. As one old soldier remarked, isn't it sad? During all the years since the First World War, we've had all the time in the world, but no money. Now we have all the money in the world, but no time. In this race against the clock, America comes together. Bombers are wheeled out of assembly lines in order to wreak havoc over Germany. Of notable distinction, are Boeing's Flying Fortress and Consolidated's Liberator, where in Europe, with Britain providing a base for operations, American air power is successful due to the short distance from England to Germany. On the other side of the world, the situation is very different. In the Pacific, aircraft with a greater range are needed in order to attack the heart of Japan. It is this geographical requirement that calls for the construction of a design that not only delivers tremendous firepower, but ensures that it reaches its target there and back safely. Operation Matterhorn, the secret plan to bomb the Japanese from China. Approved by President Roosevelt, it is in these pages that the urgent need for the super fortress is born. The initial requirements simply, as I, as I recall them, were a 5,333-mile 5, range, and I don't know why that odd number, uh, a 2,000-pound bomb load, and I think the speed that they specified was something like 273 miles an hour or something. 
those those were the uh, the basic requirements. A unique organization, the 20th Air Force is formed, headed personally by Hap Arnold to see over all B-29 operations. All the military needs now is for one company to step up. Unlike the military industrial complex of today, during the 1930s, aviation companies are hesitant to get in bed with the government to make military planes. Companies that uh, could easily be producing military goods, uh, such as aircraft factories, were reluctant to convert their plants for military production because they weren't sure how long hostilities would last. In an era of neutrality acts and cynicism towards any signs of war profiteering, only fixed price contracts are given by the United States. Under these rules, the developer must put forth their own money towards the design with no guarantee of a deal being signed. And with technology becoming more complex, signing on to the B-29 is like playing Russian roulette with your company's future. It is a large risk, one that the giants of aviation are not willing to take. As one Boeing employee said, there was no sound of coin in Uncle Sam's jeans. His pockets only carried marbles and chalk. With most manufacturers losing money during this period, few were willing to step up to the plate. The military production in which uh, U.S. workers were engaged in 1940 and 41 uh, as part of the effort to support the Allied forces, helped to pull the United States out of the Depression. Lots of people were back to work, and what that meant was that they had disposable income. Many manufacturing firms did not want to convert to military production because they were eager to take advantage of that consumer dollar that was now available. Douglas, a rare company to turn a profit during the Great Depression, is avoiding the super bomber project like the plague. After having their arms bent by the government to develop the B-19, they reported losses of more than $2 million. Not wanting to be fooled again, their submission for the contract is nothing more than a slightly modified version of that same bomber. In government circles, there is great concern. If Douglas is only putting forth a minimal effort, it is apparent that they are not interested. Lockheed, another manufacturer, is still a young company and a question mark at best. Boeing, having lost money on the B-17, would have gone bankrupt had the government not bailed them out in 1940. With only 2,000 employees, they, like others, want to stick with what is known and proven instead of venturing out into the uncertain. Surprisingly, they submit their design and it is accepted. Boeing had a tremendous reputation on the basis of the B-17. And when you think about the Pacific now, it would have been uh, uh, impossible for B-17s and B-24s to fly, fly those distances in the Pacific. And so the makers of the Flying Fortress begin the project in haste, starting work on a plane that is built before it is even designed. You would always like to build a prototype airplane and fly it and work the bugs out before you commit production uh, of the airplane. In this case, the Air Corps made it known at the very onset of the program that they were going to buy production quantities of airplanes before the prototype ever flew. Certain sections of the aircraft are constructed before detailed designs of other parts are even sketched out. They begin a long and painful journey to build one of the greatest airplanes ever. Boeing decides that the B-29 central nervous system is to be based in America's heartland, Wichita, Kansas. A small city of just 120,000 people is chosen as the site where the super fortress is to be built. Why Wichita specifically? There are a couple of reasons for this. If you look at a map of the United States, you'll see that Wichita is just about in the dead center of the country. Also, unlike some other cities in the state like Kansas City, Wichita had a very tiny proportion of foreign-born uh, residents. Uh, some government officials were concerned uh, that immigrant um, 
workers would be more inclined to participate in labor agitation, might be more inclined to come from a socialist or communist tradition, or in some cases might um, be allied with Nazism. Hundreds of miles away from America's vulnerable coasts and a farming population familiar with machinery requiring less money to live on, Wichita is ideal for Boeing. Expansion is a necessity, and the city is eager to accommodate both the government and Boeing during the war years. The Great Plains region uh, mobilized to lobby to bring industry to their area. Uh, the state of Kansas uh, organized an industrial development commission in 1939, and in fact, the governor of Kansas went to Washington, D.C. to lobby on behalf of his state, arguing that um, Kansas was safe from invasion. It had lots of natural resources, such as oil, gas, and coal, and it had a large supply of pragmatic farm boys. And so begins an assembly line of epic proportions, a similar system that Henry Ford used to make Model T's in Detroit. Boeing is using to make super fortresses in Wichita. Grandmothers, who never wrestled with anything more intricate than a wood stove up until two years ago, are building super fortresses at Wichita. What is true at Wichita probably applies equally to other major production units of the B-29 program. The super fortress truly can be said to be a product, as President Lincoln said, of their government. That is, of, by, and for the American people. Quoted from the New York Times. With a small army of workers, over 60% of the aircraft is fabricated on the spot. Unfortunately, one plant cannot do the job alone. The outsourcing of the B-29's many parts are done in cities such as Marietta, Georgia, Omaha, Nebraska, and the home of Boeing, Renton, Washington. There were something like uh, 764 airplanes on order before the B-29 ever flew. Those airplanes were going to be built by three companies in four plants. Boeing was going to build the airplane in Wichita and Seattle, the Renton plant, uh, Bell in Omaha, and Martin in Marietta, Georgia. So production was committed before the airplane ever flew, and it was a high-risk program recognized as a high-risk program from the very beginning. It is a project coming from every corner of the country, a true testament of America's industrial strength during the Second World War. As the B-29 is constructed, one notices that it is not revolutionary, but evolutionary. A true sign of the times, with militaries thinking bigger is truly better. At the beginning of American war production, the average aircraft weight is estimated to be just over 3,000 pounds. Four years later, that average is shot up to over 10,000 pounds. With this plane's massive size and potential, it comes as no shock that its supporters are eager to get up in the air as soon as possible. Although the enthusiasm for the B-29 is strong, the call for a plane of this magnitude is easier said than done. Being twice the size of the B-17 and requiring double the horsepower, completing it is no easy task. It was a big jump from, let's say, the B-17 for people who were in the 17 that went to the 29, and it was one very big jump for us who went from the B-25 to the B-29. It was monstrous. You had tremendous power in four engines uh, 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 compared to the B-17. And I flew the B-29 up to 40,000 feet, whereas uh, the B-17 would barely go to 30,000. Before being put into production, 10,000 drawings are sketched of a prototype, costing the government over $3 million. With it needing to be rushed only adds to its growing list of future problems. Its main flaw is its complexity. With a need to fly at extremely high altitudes, a pressurized cabin is desired so its crew were not required to wear masks in the air. It was the first pressurized airplane, one that I'd ever flown. I think it was the first 
the thing after the B-17, the B-24 that came along that had a pressurized cockpit, which made uh, flying at altitude far more comfortable than uh, unpressurized, of course. You kept your uh, oxygen mask handy just in case you lost your pressurization, but uh, it was very comfortable. It was a big relief, much easing of strenuous activity on the part of the whole crew. Also, with four extremely powerful engines and over 60,000 different pieces needed to assemble just one plane, this project is turning into one giant jigsaw puzzle. So the airplane that uh, got submitted had grown from an 85,000 pound airplane to something around 110 or 111,000 pounds. In addition, an enormous amount of material needed. 27,000 pounds of aluminum, 5,000 pounds of rubber, 10 miles of wiring, over 1,000 pounds of copper and brass, and nearly two miles of tubing are needed to make this monster. To some, this is becoming a case of the United States biting off more than it can chew. Despite the best efforts of its designers, engineers, and workers, the B-29 is encountering numerous problems. For a population of 120,000, putting together a 120,000 pound super fortress is a massive undertaking due to its workforce's relative inexperience. Recruited from the ranches and farms of the Great Plains, these men, and now women, have not been properly trained for a task of this magnitude. What normally takes years to learn, they must master in just months. While in flight, as is the case with Lockheed's Constellation, overheating is becoming the norm. Some of the engine problems that were there were things like uh, overheating of the engines, Early on, we had problems, uh, again, with propellers that uh, uh, would overspeed, uh, wouldn't govern properly, wouldn't feather properly. Uh, we had problems with the carburetors. The engines would backfire. During one test flight, a B-29 crashes, killing the entire crew, including Eddie Allen, Boeing's chief test pilot. Despite these deaths and setbacks, the project must continue. For America's top generals, the B-29 is becoming a race against the clock. With air bases being built in China, the expected arrival of the super fortresses is scheduled for April of 1944. I understand because of an agreement between Roosevelt and Chiang Kai-shek that these airplanes were going to be in China a year before they were. So the, the rush would get them out of the country. The crew at Boeing, however, is nowhere near completion. Despite this harsh reality, one man, General Hap Arnold, does not throw in the towel. Writing to fellow General Curtis LeMay, he proclaims, The B-29 project is important to me because I am convinced that it is vital to the future of the Army Air Forces. More concerning are the project's economic costs. By the end of development, testing, and production, the government is estimated to have spent over $3 billion on the Super Fortress, a third more than what is spent on developing the atomic bomb. For these generals, it is not only militarily vital that the B-29 succeed. Financially, if the model fails, billions will be lost. Well, when I got to Wichita, I found out they weren't flying them because Boeing Company had taken this this position that the airplane was no good and they weren't going to make them. I understand, second hand or third, that General Arnold told Boeing officials, you're going to build that airplane or give us back $50 million we've already advanced for the ports being. They thought real quick. They said, well, we'll build the airplane, but we won't take any responsibility for it. Arnold is reported to have said, you don't have to take it. The Army Air Corps will take that responsibility. These ongoing problems become crystal clear in March of 1944. Hap Arnold, on an inspection mission, asks how many are ready for shipment to India. Due to the complications in his design, he is shocked when Boeing's answer is zero. It is for this reason there lies an insurance policy, a backup, 
a contingency plan in case Boeing fails. And for this possible savior, the American government goes to the other three giants of aviation. Companies that designed their own version of the Super Fortress. The B-30, 31, and 32 can hopefully come to the rescue if all else fails. At least, that is what the government hopes. Lockheed, with their B-30, represents only a token effort. Many are unsure if they can carry through on a project of this magnitude. The plan to make their super fortress a gigantic bomber version of the Constellation goes nowhere. Their main priority is given to the Connie, which makes it up into the air nearly a year and a half before the B-29 does. The situation is identical at Douglas. Their B-31 design never sees the light of day. Of its three competitors, only one gets a plane up in the sky. Consolidated, makers of the B-24 Liberator. They, like Boeing, are commissioned to evolve their design with the B-32, known as the Dominator. Weighing 50 tons, possessing a speed of over 300 miles per hour, and containing four 2,200 horsepower engines, the aircraft appears to be a carbon copy of the Super Fortress. The B-32 was an outgrowth of the B-24, like the B-29 was an outgrowth of the B-17. And just like the B-29, the Dominator suffers from the same tactical problems. The program is almost canceled in December of 1944, due to development being severely behind schedule. By the end of the war, only a handful of B-32s fly over the Pacific, conducting mainly reconnaissance missions. The B-32, well, I had one there at Bomber Test. I flew it. It, uh, it had no distinctive uh, advantage over the B-29. Uh, matter of fact, uh, I, I, had to, I had to order my test pilots to fly it. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't much care about flying it. The key advantage for Boeing is its will and determination. With countless man and woman hours put into this project, combined with billions of dollars in funding, they are determined to complete it no matter what the cost. Being so far along with its development, they must see it through. The aircraft plants in Wichita adopted suggestion systems where workers could offer suggestions for how to improve efficiency and productivity and actually get cash awards. Uh, if their ideas were selected by management and then implemented. Uh, many of the amenities that employers offered to workers, like cafeterias, in some cases childcare centers, and so forth, were specifically designed to improve productivity and decrease absenteeism rates. War production is the foundation of our war effort. And by the same token, what you do from day to day affects your country's success in this war. Never forget, you are working for him, for the youth of America, for the boy next door. On the last day of the last war, thousands of such boys were killed. If the war had ended 24 hours earlier, they would have returned. What you do tomorrow, today, in the next hour, and help to bring the last day of this war closer and to save lives that would otherwise be lost. We are all in this together. You and I, your own boy, and the boy next door. Our job is not finished. Let's finish the job together. With a gun to their heads, the people of Kansas come together and begin rolling super fortress after super fortress off the assembly line. In the essence of uh, wartime conditions, you overcame uh, absolutely any obstacles. Uh, it may have, it may have uh, taken only one-tenth the time that it would uh, take to solve a technical problem in peacetime. But uh, under wartime conditions, you know, if you can't... Uh, if, if you can't solve it with 10 engineers, get 100. And, and that's what the contractor did. 
When Arnold, in a fit of rage, demands that 175 B-29s be on time for delivery, this almost impossible task is miraculously accomplished by the people at Boeing, Wichita. Working around the clock for four straight weeks, 600 workers meet this goal. Compared to a grand total of just four in August of 1943, by February of 1945, Boeing Wichita produces 100 B-29s per month. With 20,000 man-hours, these workers are able to produce 4.2 super fortresses a day, a shining example of both their patriotism and dedication. Until the end of the war, production is right on target. On June 5, 1944, from an Indian airbase, the first B-29s take to the sky. It has been a strenuous journey, as the aircraft has traveled more than half the world to reach its target. Ten days later, under the 20th Bomber Command, headed by Hap Arnold, 47 superfortresses depart from Chengchu, China, and begin bombing Japan mercilessly. For the next year, the B-29 becomes the primary tool of destruction in the Pacific. With the Japanese already in a weakened state, they simply could not compete with this advanced super bomber. Things only get worse as the Americans capture the Mariana Islands. With a shorter range to Tokyo, these strategic outposts do nothing but accelerate B-29 activity over the land of the rising sun. Day after day, Japan is bombed into submission. Led by General Curtis LeMay, his strategy of bomb them and burn them is proving effective. Cities the size of New York, Cleveland, and Pittsburgh are being decimated. LeMay even remarks that by mid-1945, they are going to run out of targets to bomb. That dilemma is solved on August 6, 1945. A B-29, the Enola Gay, flies over Hiroshima, Japan. Carrying an atomic bomb on board, the order to go nuclear is given by President Harry Truman. The effect of this new weapon forever changes the way wars can now be fought. The results are devastating. An estimated 80,000 people are killed from the first atomic bomb. I had seen the city perfectly visible as a place where a lot of humans were moving about. You could see it. You see movement. But when I flew back by it and I was out the co-pilot's window, that I looked at it and look, all I saw was something that reminded me of a boiling pot of tar. Three days later, another superfortress, Boxcar, drops a second atomic bomb on the city of Nagasaki, killing tens of thousands more. These two attacks, in addition to the Soviet Union's declaration of war against Japan, finally causes this once proud nation to surrender unconditionally. Aboard the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay, on Sunday, September the 2nd, 1945, the most horrible war in history came to its complete and formal end. Foreign Minister Shigemitsu signed for Japan. Douglas MacArthur, Supreme Commander. The B-29 with its years of development and construction, proves its worth to the American military. For it is truly the bomber that made the difference. It's my personal opinion, and, and I'm sure I'll found detractors, that the B-29 won the war, uh, World War II, in the Pacific. Oh, I think without a doubt, when you consider particularly the uh, Pacific War, it was a key point in winning it. And so the people of Wichita, the people of Marietta, the people of Omaha, and the dozens of other towns and cities that contributed to its production go back to their regular lives. Boeing, with no more orders from the government, lays off 70,000 workers at the end of the war. The service they have done for their country, however, does not go unnoticed. I think historians would argue that um, war production in the United States was pivotal, if not decisive, uh, in the war effort overall. 
Uh, the United States, over the course of the war, spent more than $50 billion on lend-lease aid uh, to the Allies. By 1944, U.S. factories were producing a ship a day and a plane every five minutes. But that's a phenomenal amount of production. In the B-29's history, the men and women in these plants are just as important as Hap Arnold, Curtis LeMay, and those piloted in the aircraft. It's a joint effort of everyone. The maintenance, the supply, everyone contributed to it. For a three-year period, of the over 3,000 super fortresses built, 1,600 of them come out of Wichita alone. On August 29th, in a statement to Boeing employees, General Arnold proclaims, Thanks to what you did, our combat crews had been trained and B-29s were ready and waiting to occupy Iwo Jima, Saipan, and Okinawa as each base was prepared to receive them. You were given a job to do, and the way you finished that job met our greatest expectations. For myself, and on behalf of the Army Air Forces, I say to you, well done, and thanks from the bottom of my heart. The Super Fortress should be remembered as the greatest roll of the dice in American aviation history. In an era where aircraft manufacturers had little to gain with costly military projects, it is amazing that it was able to get into the skies as quickly and efficiently as it did. The race for the Super Fortress is also truly an American story. Its industrial capacity and strength, a supply line uninterrupted from bombings and destruction, and a diligent and patriotic workforce is what made the B-29 possible. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.